Hi, I'm Charlie, and this is Cooking with Milwaukee Community Leaders. Cooking with Milwaukee Community Leaders is available both as a podcast, wherever you get great podcasts, or as video on our YouTube channel, Cooking Secrets for Men. So today I'd like to introduce my guest, Caitlin Cullen. What up, Charlie? Caitlin. How you doing? Great, great. to see you. Great. I'm happy to be here. So Cal- uh, Caitlin is the um, Food Center Director for the Kinship Community Food Center, which is used to be the River West Food Pantry. Um, and I think you're most well known for being, in Milwaukee at least, the chef owner of Tandem Restaurant. Um, and I want to thank you because Caitlin just came back from a week of vacation and she figured the best use of her time was to come here and hang out with me for an hour. Absolutely. Um, so you know, we have to question her judgment right off the bat. I'd have to be at the office otherwise. Okay. No, I, I do appreciate you coming. So we'll, we'll get to um, Kinship okay. and we'll get to uh, Tandem. I want to start where we usually start at the beginning um, because people's stories are all different and unique, but they all end up in the same place, which is people trying to make a difference in our city. So um, you were born in the Detroit area, grew up there. So talk a little bit about your formative years, your early years, and how it set the stage for the next phase of your life. Yeah. Um, Yeah, so I was born in a suburb of Detroit, um, but when I grew up, it was just kind of um, a nice little subdivision. Um, my parents bought a foreclosed house mm-hmm. um, and they bought it because we would have a chance to go to grade schools. Um, and so it was cornfields with weird suburbs in it and now it is a fancy pants place to live. Um, but it was, I think growing up there was really exceptional for a lot of reasons. So for starters, um, the school system was amazing. Uh-huh. Um, and pretty quickly my parents split up. I grew up in a world, I think largely I attribute to being white and living in a suburban area, where I grew up in a single parent household. Um, my mom worked a lot and she worked very diligently to make sure we never like were hungry. Mm-hmm. Um, but also when I wanted a Lunchable at the grocery store, she was like, we can't afford Lunchables. Like you'll be having a turkey sandwich and you'll be having an apple. Um, I remember going on a trip to Turkey with a girlfriend that I had in college. Mm-hmm. She is from a very wealthy family, and they took us on a Turkish vacation for two weeks. We were on, like, a yacht in the Aegean Sea. It was nuts. And they had peaches and cherries. It was the first time I'd ever had a peach, and it was the first time I'd ever had a cherry. And so... Did they have Lunchables? No Lunchables. Okay. But, but I got, I did, there were a lot of foods I wasn't exposed to as a young person right. because I had a parent who was really trying to feed us nourishing things and sure. get by, but there was limitations to that. Um, I think that really did inform a lot of who I became, right? So you look around the world, Detroit and Milwaukee are very similar in a lot of ways. And I grew up in the single parent household. We were always kind of scrapping by, um, but I had an opportunity for a good education. Um, I had an expectation with my community to like succeed. I, people always say like, what did you think you wanted to be when you were a kid? And I'm dead ass. I was like, I'm gonna be the president. Like people don't say that. Um, and I was raised to believe that I could literally do right. whatever I wanted. Um, right. And so by the time I got to be of an age where I thought about what I did want to do, it always trended towards kind of leveling that playing field and equalizing things for folks from all different backgrounds. Huh. So you, uh, you end up going to college at the University of Michigan. Uh, I got your bachelor's in women's and native studies. And English. And English. Ooh. I really went for it. <laughs> You haven't corrected my grammar yet, so that's a good sign. You're doing great. Okay, thank you. Um, and then master's degree. Yep. Um, and then with a certificate or certification in teaching. Yep. All right, so did you have a plan after graduating what you wanted to do? No, I was like smoking weed and selling weed. Like the reason I went to get my master's degree is I was like, oh shit, I graduated with a degree in English, women's and studies, and Native American studies. I need a job. And so teaching seemed like a pretty functional fit. Mm-hmm. Like... Um, and a great way to change things for folks at the ground level. Um, and then once I graduated my master's program and was ready to be a teacher and had spent the entire year of my program teaching in Detroit public schools, I went to a job fair and just thought I would do a warm up at like a table that had no line. Uh-huh. And that table happened to be located in the Dominican Republic in the capital city of Santo Domingo. And they just kept calling. And I was like, well, why wouldn't I move? to the Caribbean. So I took a three-year detour there. So that's what I wanted to ask you about, because you started out as a teacher, and yeah. then you ended up 
also moving to the Dominican Republic yeah. to be a teacher. Yeah. You ended up being principal at the American school there. So talk about that experience, um, both culturally and how it impacted moving to the next phase of your life. Yeah. I mean, it was a trip. Like, I moved to... It's a different time that, like, young people today wouldn't understand and that you'll still laugh at because, like, you can think of a time that was also different. Um, I moved to the Dominican with no bank accounts. Like, I closed my U.S. bank account, liquidated the $70 I had in there, got on a plane that the, the school had paid for for me. They had housing provided, and so I showed up with 70 bucks. I didn't know any Spanish. It's just like, well, this will work. I, I left my car with a friend of mine and, like, wrote what the title. Wrong? Yeah, I was like, this will be great. Um, and I learned most of my Spanish in the grocery store. Mm -hmm. So uh, the language barrier was kind of easy to figure out because I loved eating. I was broke. Mm -hmm. um, and so I had to cook at home until I got that first paycheck like three weeks later. Um, and then I, I think I adjusted to the environment fairly well. I was really interested in being in a different place in a different culture. I was like a lesbian vegan from Ann Arbor. So there were a couple things I had to learn fast, like being vegan in a developing Caribbean nation is not really tenable. And that pork is actually what you eat all the time. Yeah. Got started to adjust to, it was, it was interesting because it was a school for wealthy kids. Ambassadors, children, right. um, wealthy Dominicans who wanted their, their children to go to school in the U.S. And, and pursue like medical school there. And so the demographic was super different than Detroit public schools. but Or any public schools, yeah, for that matter, very in, much, in the city. Yeah, but also um, it wasn't that different as far as like the expectations for students, the ways in which we could fail students if we had to follow a certain set of ideas that the right. curriculum had to be and so I taught very similarly in that like an English teacher is a great way to teach somebody just how to think you know we'd read something in Detroit or in the Dominican where I'd say okay your final paper is read one of the 20 novels on this list which I had all read or read very quickly before their paper came due pick one that's interesting to you read something um, and then tell me anything you want Make an argument about the book however you want. You could decide if you're reading Ender's Game that, that the main character was an alien. If you can support that with some sort of evidence from the text, even if it's the most outlandish claim, um, you know, Hamlet is gay. Do whatever you want to do. If you can write it for me and you can show me in the text where your point of view is supported, that's all I want. Um, and so I wasn't the best English teacher because like, I'm not even sure I know what a gerund is. I wasn't really into parts of grammar. But I was interested in teaching young people how to think critically and how to see the world from a, a wider lens. Like, I find, I read a lot. Uh -huh. I find the best way to build empathy amongst people you don't understand or cultures that are different than you or just the world in general is to read somebody else's story, even if it's fiction, right? right. Fiction comes from reality. And so that's what we did. Okay. So you, you spent three years in the Dominican and somehow... You made your way to Milwaukee and got into cooking. I did. So talk about that career transformation from being an educator in a foreign country to uh, coming up here and working. I mean, you worked at uh, this place right down the road here, but that was a top 30 restaurant. I know you worked there for a while, yeah. but I think you worked at other places. So talk about the, the career change from uh, teaching to cooking. Yeah, I think um, teaching is not just a full-time job, and most teachers have another job that they can do to support themselves to live because teaching doesn't pay very well, but it's something you take home with you. It's something you, if whether it's grading or thinking about something, you never get to put it down. Um, and I then became the principal of this school and was teaching a little bit, and I was the only asshole with a master's degree, which is like basically why I got the job. Um, and we I, told her she could cuss. So I know, worry. sorry. I'm trying to, I know F-bombs, promise. Um, and I discovered cocaine in the Dominican Republic, which was, I'll tell you, the safest place on earth to do it. Because um, it's actually cocaine and not something that'll kill you. Right. But it became very much a part of my life. And so some friends came down um, in my third year there. And so they were coming for Thanksgiving. And I give thanks, but it was an intervention. Oh. And they locked me in a house for seven days. 
Uh, and I watched all of Homeland, you know, that Showtime show. Sure. I would not advise it for anyone who's like detoxing from heavy narcotics. It's very stressful watching like a bipolar schizophrenic woman think that she's uh, solving. Right, saving the world. Yeah. <laughs> Stressful. Um, but so then it was pretty clear that like I needed to get out of there because even after they left, like I was well tended to and, and had friends there helping me through, but I needed to like not be someplace where I could call a drug dealer and order an eight ball, have him stop and pick up an avocado, a pack of cigarettes and a beer on the way. And he'd charge me like Full service. 30 bucks. It was a great deal. I still miss it. Um, and so I knew I needed to come back to the States. Um, but I also wasn't ready to move back to Detroit. Right. There, it wasn't appealing to me in a lot of ways. Um, and so during that time where I was basically like waiting out the term of my contract um, and trying not to do drugs in my apartment every night, I started cooking stuff. Um, I always liked food, I always liked cooking, but um, there were a lot of things that weren't available in Santo Domingo. So um, I would look up recipes. I got a, a book that I really live by. It's called the Flavor Bible for anyone who's like just starting to learn how to cook. and it literally has every cooking ingredient you can imagine. Mm -hmm. And then chefs from all over the world tell you what stuff goes well with it. So it's like, oh, you have a mango, a jalapeno, and something else, here's what you should make. Mango's and it doesn't, awesome. yeah, it doesn't give you an ingredient, it doesn't give you a recipe though, but it gives you every flavor effort that would go yeah. with it. And so, a mango sauce is a good one. Or a chutney. Yeah, mango or, chutney. You know, <laughs> yeah, there you go. Uh, or a <laughs> hand pie. I mean, there's all kinds of things and so, I knew when I was moving back, I wanted to try my hand at cooking, even though my mother had a stroke when I told her I wasn't going to be using the master's degree I had just completed three years earlier. Um, and I knew I didn't want to go back to Detroit. And so my friend, who moved to Milwaukee with me, who we've lived in like four apartments together in the city, who recently was living in my house, we've been friends since we were 16, Maggie, um, we looked at a map of the Midwest on my computer in my classroom and I closed my eyes and pointed and hit Oconomowoc. I thought it was Oconomowoc. I hit Oconomowoc and Milwaukee was <laughs> close enough. Yeah. And so then we moved to Milwaukee. So it was a great strategy. Oh yeah. <laughs> I would advise it to go. anyone. Point and go. And at 29, you started a Tandem Restaurant. Yeah, you have better recollection of the ages I was during this. It's it's a lot of gray. Well, I read bi there. I read bios, so yeah. Um, but no, at, at twenty nine, when you have apparently lived uh, three lives, um, as opposed to most people who barely live one life, um, you started Tandem Restaurant, yeah. and uh, so talk about that, and up until the pandemic, because I think the pandemic in and of itself is um, is part of the interesting story. But you know, <laughs> moving. By picking a place on the on the map on a, with your finger and then say, "Oh, that's where I'm going to go," and I'm going to start a restaurant. Um, talk about that. Yeah, so it took a couple years to get to the restaurant. So I, I, when I moved here, um, I took any job I could really find, um, and Craigslist was what you would use for jobs sure. in those days. So I got a job at the Philly Way on Brady Street, uh -huh. and I made cheese steaks for drunk people. From I worked the 11 p.m. to 4 a.m. shift. Um, Danae, were you ever there at that time? <laughs> no. Okay. <laughs> I mean, it was wild. I think I wore like a Palin 2020 trucker hat, like camo trucker hat with orange text on it. I mean, it was a, an absurdist moment. Right. Um, yeah, and then I got a job at Bavette like three days later. And Karen always jokes, but like I worked those two jobs concurrently for a year. She was like, how are you still working at the cheesesteak place? Which may it rest in peace if Billy Way was wonderful and everyone who I worked with was on heroin. Um, it was a mess. A developer reached out to me through Karen, Julie Kaufman, and she basically had toured this building on Fond du Lac Avenue that she bought for five grand. Um, and then toured it to a couple of restaurateurs and two of those women, both Nell Benton of the National and, and Karen Bell of Bavette, looked at it and said, ah, it's not for me, but I think I might know someone. And so the second, but I think I might know someone, uh, convinced Julie. You were the, the someone both times? Yeah. And, yeah. and Julie took a real chance. I would, I had been cooking for like two and a half years. Uh -huh professionally um, but she went to Michigan as well so that was kind of an in and um, I can talk a, a, I can talk a lot and so I just kind of convinced her with a business plan that I wrote using like how to business plan at the library that came with some software and ran around and asked everybody I knew to give me money that they knew they'd probably never see again as an investment 
um, which I'd say like most people didn't get their money back, but they were okay. And we opened this place on Fond du Lac where over the years we employed like 150 young people who had never really had jobs before. And then the pandemic hits. And so in the spring of 2020, um, everything shuts down. Yeah. Um, but you, uh, through Tandem, um, provided meals to those in need. Um, I mean, the numbers can vary, but it was significant amounts. We stopped know. counting at 125. So, like, the I think the Journal Sentinel number is 125,000 because Carol was like, I'm only going to print what you have records of. But it got real wishy-washy there at the end. Right. So that that, that, um, that was, I guess, uh, Tariq Moody, who, friend of the show, has been on here at 88.9 Radio Milwaukee and Hyphen, um, somehow connected you with Jose Andres. Yeah. Um, my guy from D.C. We used to go to his little teeny Haleo restaurant oh. like 30 years ago. I said, this is not a bad place. This yeah. guy's all right. This guy, and then now he's real famous. Um, so, but the World Central Kitchen, which is Jose Andres' um, charity foundation nonprofit, which feeds all over the world, invested. Um, so talk about that. and that Because that was certainly a, you know, a, a great thing that was... It may have killed you, but it was a great thing that was going on. Yeah, so it had almost killed me. Um, at the time, I think, like, we were... I don't know if anyone can remember what February 2022 or 2020 felt like. We were going to be hot shit. The DNC was coming to town. Right. We were right down the block. We were doing the thing. I was like, the Obamas are going to eat here. We were finally not in debt for the first time of owning the restaurant. So, like, we, I had no idea what I was doing. That business plan template looked good. But I was like, I owed the feds a bunch of money for a bunch of time because I had no idea what was going on. We finally paid everything off. And then I broke my ankle and we almost lost the business because I was working for free 80 hours a week. And we made it through that. And so we were like, it's on. And then it happened. So I was just like, oh, well, looks like we're going out of business. And so we just started giving everything away in the form of meals. And then it became um, kind of crazy because as soon as people saw us doing that, people started donating money for us to do that because everyone felt so helpless. They're all trapped at home. Right. And so now all of a sudden we've got major cash flow and every other restaurant in the city is drowning, hemorrhaging, going to go out of business. Nobody has a job, whatever. So we started tapping on people and saying, hey, come help us make this food. And so it went from like just us making food to us and good kind and the national making food and, and it slowly grew out from there. And then I looked around and all the businesses that we had as partners were all like these white owned businesses because they were the only people returning my calls. And so I handed a neighbor, uh, Monica, who used to own sauce and spice pizza in the Sherman Phoenix, I handed her a stack of cash and I was like, knock on doors people are not going to answer phone calls they're freaking out they don't know what to do um like go start bugging restaurants and ask them and so we just started all of a sudden assembling not just a small group of people making food we assembled an army it was like at our highest like 52 or 53 restaurants um and we were taking all this money that people were giving us and pushing it right back out the door so um the world central kitchen showed up right at the right time like they i think end of april and those first couple weeks, people were really throwing cash out there, and then I think they realized, like, oh, shit, this might not end. And so the cash flow slowed down, and they had been piloting a program. I get the Sunday Times, and so, like, I'm reading my Sunday Times, like, oh, and on the back of the main section, I'm like, there, there's a program that's doing what we're doing. That's so neat, paying restaurants to make food. And I closed it, and then I get a message from Tariq. I'm like stoned walking around my neighborhood visiting my neighbors you know how people are like in the pandemic everyone just wandered around and waved and so i'm walking around he's like hey can i bug you about something and i was like no i'm chilling we'll talk later and he was like you really want to hear this before tomorrow morning and he had sent an email to like info at world central kitchen i mean it was like the most basic letter and he just wrote about what we were doing and i think you know you know Tariq, he's like a He's an indoor kid. And so he's sitting alone in his house, freaking out. And he's the exact demographic of people who are disproportionately dying in our city. And he's like, what am I going to do? So he just threw this Hail Mary pass and they showed up. I mean, they, when all was said and done, they hit pretty close to a million bucks that they put into Milwaukee. And so things you learn after the fact, if you're not a nonprofit, 
Um, you should not receive a million dollars and redistribute it dollar for dollar to other. The government for, want taxes or something? They didn't <laughs> love it. And um, taking in that much money, even though we spent every penny of it, um, made us ineligible for every possible pandemic relief, any reopening money, any restaurant relief fund, all of that was off the table. Right. Um, but we had fun for the most part, I think. We had hired a young, so we always hired people who didn't, uh, we didn't care if you had a criminal record, we didn't care what your background was. Right. If you gave a good interview, <clears throat> if you knew somebody, you could pretty much have a job. And so I had a young man, not so young actually, like in his 40s, working for us running deliveries um, that had come through a friend and he uh, stole like a couple pages out of my checkbook. Cause I, he's a smart guy. He saw me opening up this big checkbook and stroking like 40 to <laughs> $50,000 in checks every week. And so, but we live in a very trusting environment. I just put my checkbook back up behind the bar and he took a bunch of checks out. And within the course of four days, cashed $27,000 worth of checks, which made it impossible <laughs> for us to sort of re-up. So by this point, we'd had a contract with the city of Milwaukee. I mean, I've never seen Milwaukee mobilize money fast. No offense, guys. Um, but they, <laughs> the city of Milwaukee, really, Steve Mahan pulled a rabbit out of his yeah. hat. Thank you. I was going to say something offensive. Uh, <laughs> pulled a rabbit out of his hat, and with the help of, of buddy Patrick, they brought out like $350,000 to deliver these meals to people in their homes. So Milwaukee is winter, r restaurants are bad in winter, restaurants are bad in the winter and pandemic people can't stand outside in the cold. <laughs> and so we had this contract with the city and someone just stole $27,000 with the city's money and I just flipped my lid. Um, and had, I think we'd call it like a gentle nervous breakdown. I went home and just pulled all the covers over me and my wife and went in with a bunch of people and like kind of figured it out for me while I sobbed in the bed for a couple of days. Um, and eventually it got reconciled. We got our money back from, you know, the bank and made it happen. But um, I took a break. I was like, we're taking, we're gonna take a month paid off. Everybody go. I went on a backpacking trip with some friends in the UP. Um, and basically once I was there was like, I don't want to come back. And so I stayed and worked at a national park kitchen for six wow. weeks. Um, and while I was there, it was a lot easier for me to admit I didn't want to reopen the restaurant as a restaurant. So a bunch of people who don't know you from Adam aren't like, oh, your restaurant's the best. Oh, what you do for the city? Oh, it was just a bunch of fucking strangers who were also hiding from something by moving to an island to cook for no reason, right. where there's more moose than there are people. And so by the time I came back, I was pretty clear that I wasn't going to reopen. So the, you can make the story as short as you want, but you, you gave it away or you, uh, how would you describe it? Um, 18th and Final Act's a tough storefront to fill. Right. Julie um, and Jeremy, who was Jeremy Davis, who was my other landlord, um, we just kind of decided like they were going to run a panel of people to interview candidates. I figured if we put out a call, you'd get more candidates. And there were quite a few folks who just emailed resumes, emailed letters of intent, um, things they wanted to do. And really what it was, was um, everything in the space, right? So we had the space, we had purchased new equipment. There was plates, there was towels, there was mops, there was booze, there was dry goods, there was probably furniture. So, I mean, it was about $60,000 according to my accountants the same thing in a controlled environment. Um, but the goal is really to, after 12 months, which is a super long time to spend with somebody in a paid format, um, have somebody leave the program knowing like, oh, this is what I'm gonna do. Right. I am going to take this job over here. Oh shit, I paid off all these old bills. I got a car, I had a DUI and we got it reconciled. Like all these barriers to just living your life freely um, we try and help remove those and also give you a deeper sense of community, get you tied in tighter with people who have a vested interest and stake in your success. So you, you mentioned Lauren. So we want to bring dog. <coughs> Lauren, let's come on over. Lauren is a graduate. Should I hop her. out of this chair? Yeah, I'm going to be, have a seat here, Lauren. Thank you. Come on, check yourself on the screen. You look cute. 
Lauren got dressed up today and put on makeup. I didn't manage uh, that. I have no <laughs> makeup on. Oh my god, you look great. Thank you very much. Um, so Lauren, tell us a little about yourself, um, your background, and um, working in the being in the workforce development program. So I've been coming to Kinship way before it was Kinship, back mm -hmm. when it was River West Food Pantry, uh, since I was a little kid, and um, way before Ben or anything. So I was there when they first started. Um, I kind of had it together. I mean, we really don't, but um, life lifed, and I became an addict over time. I went through a lot in life, and um, just felt the community there so deeply that like I became friends with her. Just, it was so naturally, and one day she says, hey, you know, do you want to go and do this? And I'm like, God, when, when I've been waiting for y'all to ask me <laughs> to come work here, because, you know, I volunteer. I I've never spoken. thought she'd say yes, by I've the way. I've spoken, and, like, I really, truly believe in the whole kinship. Like, I adopt people. Mm -hmm. um, I just love really deep, so. All right, so I interrupted you. It's okay. Um. No, I just, I've always loved the vibe there. Um, I've raised a lot of children through my life, and now I'm down to just my two biological. Mm -hmm. um, but it seems to me like I don't have a lot of family that are blood. So being there and having the support, not just for me, but my children, mm -hmm. really means more than anything when it comes to me. So when they not only invested in my children, but then myself, it was like, okay, these people actually kind of do appreciate me. and see my potential and I'm like I can get a job like I know I don't need that it's that I want to have a career and I want to know that I can do this right. and and if I do stumble and fall or just need a little support I have it no matter what no matter what like just like today when she says hey you want to come and do this with me I'm like absolutely like don't know what we're doing but absolutely because that's just how we are there. Like we're, we show me. up for each other. Yeah. yeah. Thank and, you very much. But we—that's the thing. Like we all have stomachs, and we all bleed red. So at the end of the day, when you're breaking bread with people, that's a great way to get to know someone. Yeah. I mean, we all have our traditions. Like she does more herbs. I do more garlic. She doesn't do garlic. You know, and then we kind of mess. What? I don't yes. not do garlic, oh but you know, not as much. Not as much. Don't say that to an Italian. I'm that's sorry. Italian. That's there you go. So, um, but. The workforce program really got me through some really difficult things. Mm -hmm. um, I was at my lowest low. I had mentioned that I've raised a lot of children. Um, one of my adopted daughters just up and left one day, left me a thank you note after raising her from a baby to 15 years old. It broke me. As a mom, it was like, what am I doing? I thought mm -hmm. I was a good mom, you know, and I was kind of at my lowest of lows, even being sober. Um, and them coming to me and being in the first cohort, I'm like, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use this. I'm going to be a leader, and I'm going to help make this work because I believe in this. And I feel like everyone needs that chance. You never know what someone's going through, what they've been through. I've been through the ringer. I won't go over it, <laughs> but I've been through the ringer. And um, just like she said, like, being white, I have a mixed family, so I kind of have grown up kind of in the hood per se and had been a little rough around the edges so sometimes people take a look at me and they're like write me off don't give me the time of day whereas now going through this program graduating I'm gonna be uh, running a cafe here in a minute at St. John's Cathedral Congratulations. and um, I now I'm confident I can do that oh, great. and if I fall down I can always give them a call. <laughs> I, I, the kinship is part of I go to St. Mary's downtown and Kinship is part of that, and Father Tim, and Vincent are good friends, and St. Casimir, and the whole bit. So um, the, the, there's great work being done at Kinship. Um, you're an example. My guy, Orlando, Blondie, is an example of people who've come through uh, the program, working with Kinship, working, volunteering, and then, you know, you're going to be at, at St. Saint, Saint Luke's? No, St. Saint John's. St. John's. And Blondie's over at the Diplomat, the big shot chef now. I hope he remembers us. Um, so, congratulations. Thank you. That's I and thanks for telling that. your story. We appreciate yes. that. And thanks for coming because I hate doing this stuff. All right, so what are we making today? We are going to make a chicken pot pie. Ooh. I like to keep it easy, I like to keep it snazzy. Um, it's kind of a cheater pot pie. We're using crescent rolls. 
This so is we're cooking secrets for Ben. Cooking That's what we do. We we find shortcuts. How, how do you make good tasting food in a quick amount of time? And you you know you make shortcuts. We're not making we're not making dough here. Thank you. Um, no problem. All right. So we've done a little prep work. Uh, give us a little minute, and then we'll come back here and we'll we'll get going. All right. So here we are over at the stove. So Caitlin and Lauren, take it away. Let's do it. Okay. I like this recipe a lot because it is very easy to make quickly. Um, so for Christmas and my family, we get a lot of bodies. Um, and I get to cook three Christmas dinners. I do Christmas Eve with my direct family and in-laws. Then I do Christmas Day, like an early Christmas Day with my extended in-laws. And then we drive to Detroit and do a literal other... Christmas Day dinner. And you're cooking all of it? I'm cooking all of them. Mm -hmm. I'm very particular. Sounds like, sounds like our house. <laughs> exactly. So um, I like to do something like this. This probably will be the second Christmas Day because it's going to save me from having to prepare food like five times. Right. Um, and so it's nice because you can make it in advance. So I enjoy this because I can get it prepped up, throw it in the fridge, and get it over with. I'm just using probably, what would you call that, a tablespoon and a half of butter. Um, and then well, Lauren, Caitlin, you know there's no such thing as too much butter, so never. don't well, be shy. Just wait. I'm going to add a lot more. Okay. <laughs> but I'm trying, trying to be kind of delicate. For the sake of making it easy, we've got a rotisserie chicken, which is already busted up. Um, I've got some mushrooms. Charlie did all the nice chopping for us, so I haven't had to mess with too much of that. Um, but think standard pot pie stuff. You can add whatever is more exciting to you or less. So. Standard pot pie, you're gonna need onions, you're gonna need carrots, and you're gonna need celery. Those are kind of non-negotiable. Right. Um, and I might use almost all of these. Promise me you'll use the rest somewhere. Well, we're feeding a lot of people, so. I'll use them all. All right. Throw them Go for um, it. But other things I really love to add are mushrooms. You can mm -hmm. use basically any kind you can get your hands on. They don't even need to be in very good shape um, because you're gonna cook the crap out of them. Um, and I swear sometimes, Charlie, am I gonna get in trouble? Oh. Okay, I'll do my very Wrong. best. Where no is basically F cable. No F bombs, but I will. Oh, uh, I would edit probably. those out. Uh, okay, so, and then I've also got some turnips and some parsnips. A rutabaga is nice in here. Um, it's literally just any root veggie that you want to throw in. Um, and then we're going to, I'm going to rough chop while you're sauteing. Those are butter. Good. Yeah, throw them all in, girl. Good. So we're going to put them all in at the same time. Yeah. I like to put the big guys in the bottom. There we go. Like All right, so we got onions, carrots, and celery. Celery. Parsnips. Parsnips. Here's the onions. There's onions. Turnips there. Turnips. Yeah, I've I've stopped using potatoes in stews. Yeah, you don't need it. I like I like the no, I like they give you the same parts. texture, but oh, we're gonna fill this pot. Oh, we're gonna yes, fill this. Yes, we pot. are. Well, it's gonna mm -hmm. cook now. And so while she's doing that, I'm just going to chop up some herbs. Um, it can be a fairly rough chop. I've always, it's one of the first things we learn, literally in any kitchen I've been running, is being really precious about cleaning fresh herbs off of the stems is a fool's errand. If a stem breaks in your hand when you're trying to clean the herbs off, it's soft enough to cook with. Right. It's a little different maybe if you're going to eat something raw, but really when you're eating raw herbs like basil or cilantro or parsley, all of that is tender enough that you can eat the stems as well. So I just always encourage people, you know, the first job you give somebody, like clean off all this time. The first time they do it takes an hour and a half. She's talking about me. Yeah, I'm talking about you, exactly. <laughs> The real story is like, don't be precious about it. This much time should take a minute and a half tops to clean. So I'm gonna pull down on the back end and pull forward at the front end. Yeah, just it. strip it through. Just strip it quick. How we do it over here? Good. I just don't want her to get stuck and burn, so I'm gonna move her around a little bit. We got a lot of buddies in here. All right. Oh, so we good. have uh, fresh thyme, fresh rosemary, and then we got some sage also. Yeah, and those are easily purchased when you go to like pick and save roundies or whatever. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm gonna go really heavy handed with the seasonings here. Yep. Normally I would throw these in at like right at the start of the cook, mm -hmm. but because there's so much in that pot, throwing them in a few minutes a later is not gonna cause any trouble. Are we oh. cooking this all in the stove top? So we're actually gonna end up putting it in the oven. Okay. Um, and I'm going to make a mess of your kitchen. That's okay. 
How are we looking, Lauren? We're looking a little steamy. Okay, so that steamy point right there, mm -hmm. where it's already kind of reduced in size by, say, mm -hmm. like a quarter, mm -hmm. that's going to be right before things really start to stick at the bottom. Yep. So we're going to let it sit still for okay. a second. We're going to try and steam out some of that uh, liquid, and it's really the mushrooms yeah. um, that are your biggest culprit, but also your carrots and your onions are going to be pretty wet. We do want it to stick to the bottom, which is a controversial thing. So, I mean, you have these, you have two of these nice pans, so I know you understand the value and the virtue of letting things get stuck to the bottom of the pan, because um, that is that flavor that we want. Um, normally, I'd reduce it with some white wine or something at the tail end. Um, but today I just figured if there was a bottle of white wine open and I was heading to a Christmas party, I might end up drinking in the middle of my work day. And uh, I like my job, so I want to keep it. Well, that's, yeah. This was Saturday morning. We, you know, we think about it, but. Yeah, that's, okay. a, that's, a, that's a Sunday afternoon. We're hanging around. I'll open the wine to cook with and then maybe drink a little. We're just going to toss all mm -hmm. that in there. Sure. And then give that a good stir. Slices in. I like the orange. Orange. Make the Rosemary, oh. thyme, sage, Sweet. and Sweet. salt so far. And we're going to put in pepper. This is really yeah. cooked oh, down it's a lot. Down. It's yeah. going to cook down even more. Good. And Lauren's on her way to running her own kitchen. Yes. Where are you going? I'm going to be going to St. John's Cathedral's Open Door Cafe. I'll be oh, okay. the head cook there starting Congratulations. on Friday. Thank you. I'm very excited. So do you want any, are you putting anything on these? No, I'm going to just, just go, go straight up. Okay. If you're making like a 9 by 13 at home, you can go ahead and just use yeah. one to cover. That's my thought was if we were using the big pot, we needed we need to. We need a little double time. You're a smart man. This is not your first cooking show. No. So we want it to start sticking. Let me just take a peek. Oh, yeah. So we're starting to get a little brown on there. We still need a little more time. What's What comes next? The chicken so, um, or the so egg? What comes next? So if you are going to use wine, you'd splash a little in once we start sticking right. to the bottom. Deglaze. We're just going to use broth to deglaze because okay. it's going to be a little more family friendly. Um, then I'm going to stir in some of that better than bouillon to taste. So it might have looked like I used a lot of salt before. I did not use nearly enough salt. Um, and the reason I did that is because that better than bouillon is going to have a lot, of, yeah. a lot of flavor in it. We're going to go ahead and add another pad of butter just for you, Charlie. Ooh. And we're going to let that butter melt down. Working for me. And we're going to add about an equal amount of flour to that. Okay. We're going to turn our heat low. And we're going to stir doing. and scrape constantly. Okay. Um, so we want to cook the flour and we want to cook the butter um, together so that we can create a strong roux. And then once we've cooked the flour and butter for two or three minutes, then we'll be adding our chicken stock. Then we'll be stirring in some of that better than bouillon. Then we'll be stirring in our chicken and our peas. Mm -hmm. um, we're gonna let all that simmer for just a second. Make sure all our veggies are tender. Give it okay. a taste for seasoning. Add a little black pepper, and we're in business. Okay. All right. So let us. Uh, we'll be back in just a minute when we're ready for the the next step. All right. So we're ready for the next steps. I think so. So if you look down in here, Charlie, the pan is starting to kind of. Some of this stuff is sticking. We love that sticking. So Lauren, you want to throw a big old pat of butter in there? Oh, yes. Yeah. Like that. I'm going to turn it nice and low to a simmer. Um, butter and flour are fairly easy to burn. Um, and not only will that give it a bad flavor, but if we're not able to scrape up the butter and flour that stick to the bottom of the pan, um, our sauce is going to end up pretty clumpy. Right. If this doesn't turn out, Danae made it. All right, I'm sprinkling a little flour. That's the oh, egg. got him! Uh, sprinkling a little flour on there. It's gonna tighten up pretty much right away. Um, I might add even a little bit more flour because if you'll recall, we put in that original pad of butter to saute stuff, um, and then we added butter. So all of that fat is still in there. And if you can see, Charlie, look at this. It's like sticking in there. I'm gonna really make sure that sticky stuff is getting scraped off the bottom and nothing stays in one place mm. for too long. Looking That's good. Goodness. That's the fla That's the flavor. A little more flour. A little more. Uh, a wet pot pie is a real drag, you know what I mean? Sometimes you really want it uh, thick, especially if you're going to use an under crust. Not everything, yeah, like Lauren. Lauren would make everything from scratch. You can definitely smell the um, the herbs. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the, the sage and the rosemary are definitely 
out in front. See how gooey that's getting? I love it. Italian pot pie. Italian pot pie. Fusion pot pie. That's yeah. actually what we're here for. That's a great restaurant idea. Fusion pot pie. Lauren, should we go into business that's together? Good. Wait, I'm never having a restaurant again. So make sure that that's very clear. Abundantly. I get asked like once a month, like, are you ever thinking of doing a restaurant again? And I would never, ever dream. My side business now is helping other people get out of restaurants. <laughs> Seriously, I'm the first text message when someone's like, uh, I hate my food business, please help. And I'm like, girl, let's look at your financials. You don't have to do this anymore. It's safe out here. There are jobs that have dental insurance. It's unbelievable. Okay, so we're getting close. Um, it's real gummy and nice. We're cooking this on low again so it doesn't burn. I'm gonna kind of scrape these sides a little, although that'll be easier with the stock. Um, this is gonna be weird, but I'm gonna taste what we're working with, with some of that flour butter mixture on there. That's not weird. Cause we don't want it to taste too floury. You can overcook spices in hot grease. You can overcook vegetables and meat in hot grease. You really can't overcook a flour. I mean, what is it? You know, there's a tradition of southern dishes that are all about how long you can manage to cook your flour. Right. So I'm going to add this slowly and I'm going to start bringing that heat up a little. All right, so I got a little chicken stock. Yep, a little chicken, chicken stock. And oh, I'd love that's for you chicken to broth. really but scrape mm -hmm. and stir in. Mm -hmm. Broth, stock, you can use I use all. them interchangeably, but I, yeah. I, they're not the same, but they are to me. For most home cooks, it's the same thing. Yep, okay. I'm going to add a little more. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this, that's a four cup yeah, I think we're at about three cups okay. in there. We're going to turn up our heat a little bit, not too high. And we want to get that simple. And now, then, keeping in mind, we're going to have to make it a little wetter because we are adding all this chicken and all those peas. So because this is the bigger pot, we're using four cups. Correct, yes. yeah. So this is a great product. There's about 15 different kinds. There's uh, seafood, there's chicken, there's a vegetable. And it's basically very concentrated stock in... Um, not, that's not liquid form, in solid form. It's like a gelatinous yes. goo. So you would normally melt this much into like eight ounces of water right. or a little more than a cup. I'm gonna stir it in here because it's gonna really add a robust chicken flavor. This is especially important if you haven't made your own stock, so if you're using a broth or a stock from the store. Once we get to um, the halftime part, we're gonna put this in the oven, correct? Yep. And then we're going to wait and then we're going to come back and finish it. All right, so put so, a little black pepper in. Yep, so I don't like to start with black pepper because it can be very spicy. All right. Um, we're gonna add our chicken. Lauren, you wanna stir that yes. in? Okay, so this is Give one rotisserie chicken. Give it a couple scrapes along the bottom while you're at it. And you can hear this. I the, so prefer rotisserie chicken. You prefer it? Yes. Yeah. Um, and then last things last, the peas. World's greatest cooking adventure, or one of the world's greatest so cooking adventures. So we'll mix adventures. those in, and we're going to cut the heat off. They're going to stay hot enough. They're frozen. They're completely yeah. cooked. Okay. I'm just going to get her in there. Yum, yum, yummy. So I'm just going to scrape the sides down to make sure everything's kind of submerged in a way and evenly in there. We're going to throw our beautiful little crusts on. All right. It might be a little sticky. Um, let's make a little pattern. What do you think? Oh, my gosh. Look at how you did that. Gorge. Right? Good. Gorge. You and must then, have done well in geometry in school. She did. We'll throw those in, and then that these will be extras in case, Ooh. since there is no undercrust. Yes. We got extras. All right, so we're putting Going this in. in. Do we have room? I didn't make the mess in the oven. She's the one with the... Oh, you have no idea what our oven looks like. All right. And then, honestly, just until those, um, until it sets, to be, uh, to be really honest, I'm actually going to throw this yeah, on top so quick good. so that my buns don't burn anymore. Right. Mm -hmm. Good thought. Since I power cooked them. And I'll just settle that in there. Doesn't need to be anything yeah. special. Yeah. We'll take it off for about the last five minutes just so that those buns that have gotten kind of steamy. And timing wise, how long do you think we'll be in? 15 to 20. 15 to 20 minutes. Okay. Yep. Could be up to 30 if you really want to get jazzy with it, but I think 15 to 20 will cover us. All right. So we'll be back in like 15, 20 minutes to put it all together. Boom. All right, here we are. So, uh, let's see if I can pull this up. Excuse me there, Lauren. Ah, don't touch it. I can touch it. Oh, you got asbestos oh. fingers. Yes, sir. So we've got... I can't hold it that long. <laughs> it's really, really good. Gorgeous. And this is... So tell us what we got here, Caitlin. 
Uh, so this is our chicken pot pie with root vegetables and a little crescent roll on top just yum. to keep it classy. Yum, yum, yum. All right. I'll put the top on because we got the, we have to feed the audience too. It's like, does Oprah feed the audience? I don't know. Or they just give away cars? I was going to say they just give away good stuff. I'll All take right. your car. I'll take All right. This. Napkin my butt. Yep. I already got mine down. It's up <laughs> right at the table. All right, Lauren. Cheers. Cheers. Of course, get, get the one? girl yep. with the fake teeth. So. All right. Yeah. Just enough for camera. Just Lauren. enough. It's going to be hot yeah. as hell. Yeah. Perfect. Whole hot. It's a little warm, <laughs> but that's where those good fake teeth come in. Mmm. Mm. Delicious. That is Still pretty good. You'd think I've made this before. This is, and that the chicken holds up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And everything holds up. The rotisserie chicken's the real hack. Yes. Don't waste all your time. Yeah. And you get the bones for free. Wow. You know, this is great. delicious. I was really hungry. I'm, yeah. Well, I'm always hungry, so. Yeah. Mm. I made this for years for my kids growing up. It was the easiest thing for them when they were little. What do you say, new chef? I say a 10 out of 10. <laughs> I'd give it a strong 8, 8 uh, and a half. Uh, I'm a pot pie baby. Well, this is, this is fabulous. <clears throat> well, we're going to continue to eat, but I want to thank Caitlin. Thank you so Thanks much. for having us, Charlie. This has been really a hoot, like I'm, I said. I really, Lauren, nice thank to meet you. you. Oh, absolutely. It's a pleasure. Um, <clears throat> Thanks everybody out there. Um, please like and subscribe. Appreciate the support for Cooking with Milwaukee Community Leaders. And we'll see you next time. Thanks for listening to another episode of Cooking with Milwaukee Community Leaders. Cooking with Milwaukee Community Leaders is brought to you by Cooking Secrets for Men, LLC, and was recorded in the Third Ward in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. We feature and profile community leaders who are trying to make Milwaukee a better place. The tagline is, serious people with serious jobs having a little fun. Our guests choose the recipes that we use on the show. All of our podcasts are available on iTunes, Spotify, and wherever you get great podcasts. The original YouTube video for this episode is available on our YouTube channel, Cooking Secrets for Men, all rights reserved. Thanks, and see you next time on Cooking with Milwaukee Community Leaders.